Welcome to the Creation Today Show. I'm Eric Hovind. The book of Hebrews has an entire section dedicated to the men and women of the faith. And these are men and women that that stood out from others as, as people who truly followed God. We hear of Noah and Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, even Moses, men and women who'd followed God by faith. Well, if the author of Hebrews were writing chapter 11 of his letter in modern times, I believe he would include the name Dr. John C. Whitcomb. If you do not know, uh, Dr. John Whitcomb co-authored the Genesis Flood book with Dr. Henry Morris, and it is this definitive book that began the modern creation science movement. It was really the turning point in thinking for people in both science and in scripture, in theology. Well, a brand new book is out on his life, and it is, it's good. I mean, it's really, really, really good. The title is A Good and Faithful Servant, The Life and Times of Professor John C. Whitcomb. Uh, It's interesting. My guest today is the author of this biography, and he's the son of Dr. John Whitcomb. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. David C. Whitcomb. Dr. Whitcomb, welcome to the Creation Today Show. Eric, thank you so much for having me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Well, I I gotta say, I, I I feel torn here because you had an amazing dad, and you have an amazing journey on your own. I know we're here to talk about your dad and about his book, uh, but just reading about your life and hearing about what you're doing is fascinating. So I've got to have you on the show another time just to talk about genetics and disease. And can you give can you give people a summary, kind of real quick, of uh, your you you have your own accomplishments that I'd love to talk about. Can you give a quick summary and then let's jump to your dad? Yes. So um, I was raised in a Christian home and uh, was led to the Lord by my father at age seven. Uh, He really wanted me to be a pastor, but you have to have a calling to be a pastor, and I did not have that calling. I really struggled in school with dyslexia. We didn't know what it was at the time. All we knew is that I couldn't read or write or take notes. (laughs) I finally found uh, three things that that really changed my life. Um, The first one was coffee. And it turns out that <laughs> dyslexia is helped by coffee. And I could read and write for the first time. And I discovered that uh, wow. in college. Uh, the second thing was a creator. And through uh, my uh, high school years and early college, I just struggled with uh, attention deficit disorder and understanding directions and very frustrated. I know my father had high ambitions for me, but you know, I was, the, uh, I was on the dean's other list. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so um, I finally came to the point where I just said, you know, uh, my father taught me that everyone is created for a purpose. Mm. And uh, so I just finally uh, told God, I don't know what you're doing with me. Um, I give up doing it on my own. Just, wow, you know, guide me. And uh, I ended up uh, finding my way into graduate school and medical school at the Ohio State University, and then uh, went to Duke University uh, for advanced training. And I met uh, two old ladies there uh, that uh, had a inflammatory disease of the pancreas called pancreatitis. And I asked my mentor, I said, why do these women have this terrible disease? And he said, well, they're alcoholics. And I said, no, they're not. And he said, they have to be alcoholics. That's the only known cause. And I said, they are not alcoholics, I'm absolutely certain. He said, don't you know how to take a interview? And I said, don't bother, they're conservative Baptist. They don't drink and they don't lie. (laughs) And I said, who's working on this disease? And he said, nobody. Um, It's a hopeless disease because the inflammation destroys the organ before you know that it's uh, having a problem and uh, you just can't biopsy it or like any like some of the other organs so you can't figure it out and i said well who's working on it he said nobody and he said you better not work on it you'll throw your career away i said yeah thanks for the advice i went back and i told those ladies i I mean i can see them in my mind 
as uh, in front of me, I said, I don't know the reason you have this disease, but it's not from alcohol. I was told that it is a hopeless cause, wow. but a hopeless cause needs a champion. And I'm determining right now to find the cause of your disease. And the third C was a cause and uh, it was to pursue uh, understanding of, of complexity. And uh, that turned out to be a remarkable uh, focus of my life and uh, being able to use a secret approach to understanding complex diseases. And that was the body is not a random group of mutations. It was actually designed and you can use reverse engineering to understand complexity. I love and it. And people are going, how do you figure this out? And I said, well, I just follow my instinct, but my instincts are led by God and it's been wow. an incredible career. I have over 400 papers I've published, been an editor of a major journal. I've uh, led the GI division at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, in the GI division for 17 years, built it up to one of the top three GI divisions uh, in the country and also started a biotech company that uh, is determined to uh, allow physicians at the point of care seeing a patient with a complex disease to sort it out using their smartphone in one second. Oh my goodness. Wow. So that's what I do. So that's why you guys, you, you're, you're hearing me say, I want to talk to Dr. Whitcomb just about what he does. That, that sounds fascinating. Okay. But today's show where we're going to highlight his dad, Dr. John Whitcomb, because he really is one of the two fathers of the modern creation science movement. So, hey, if you guys are joining me on Facebook or on YouTube or you're listening to our podcast or watching us on the television show, we just want to say thank you for peering into the Creation Teddy community for this conversation. Uh, we really are. We're just a group of people that are being discipled through weekly conversations so that we can be all that God has called us to be. You're going to find out that's who Dr. Whitcomb was. He just wanted to be everything that God wanted him to be. Uh, and, and our goal is really just turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones on people's journey to come to know Christ. So if you ever want to join us in our little community, come on over to creationtoday.org. All you got to do is just partner with us at creationtoday.org and you can be part of our community. Hey, to my Creation Today partners on here, Andrew and uh, Jerry and John, uh, Nate, good to see you, PK, great to see you guys, all of you guys that are on here. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Uh, I do have a giveaway and it is this book. I want to give away several copies of this book. So if you're interested in getting a copy of this and you're on our social media page, watching live on social media right now, sorry, podcast listeners, I need to do something for you guys, but you're, this isn't live. So you guys are missing out. You got to jump over uh, to the live to be able to get this. If you're live with us on YouTube or on Facebook uh, or our creation partners, I want to give you a copy. All you got to do, uh, the ladies will pick somebody. You need to comment something. So let's do this. Um, if you want to be entered to win a copy of this book, which I'm, we're going to get into, it's amazing. I, I was, well, I'll tell you in a minute what I was doing last night. All you have to do, I want you to comment um, who has been the biggest spiritual influence in your life. So you can just give a name or you can say it's a title. Uh, you can say this is, um, uh, you know, somebody who uh, you're a Sunday school teacher, a teacher, a professor, a pastor, a youth pastor. Uh, comment who's been the biggest spiritual influence in your life. And the ladies in the office will pick somebody. And here in just a few minutes, we'll call you out and, uh, and tell you how to get your copy of this book. Um, Dr. Whitcomb, when I read this, and, and yesterday um, a lot, I, I was going through some of this and uh, sitting in the office there, and, and, I'm, and I'm literally tearing up crying as I go through who your dad really was. Um, it's, you cannot help but read this and go, this, this is somebody who I want to be. This is somebody who I want to mentor me. This is somebody who I want to be tutored from. Um, just the man of who he was. What, what is it that made your dad into the man that we now know today as the father of the creation science movement? Well, you know, that's a, uh, an important question that I've been asked. And I was asked in a different way. Um, I was often asked when I was younger, um, your dad is so nice and gracious when he's in public. What's he like in private? Yeah. And I said, he's the same. <laughs> That's him. He is a humble, gracious man who has one desire, and that is 
to spread the gospel. He, mm. he wanted to uh, evangelize and to teach others and uh, prepare them so that in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, that uh, he would be able to surround himself by faithful servants of the word who were able to learn and to teach others. And what uh, I learned by putting this biography together is that in the years before I knew him, he spent uh, every waking hour in Christian ministry serving. And that's, that's who he was. He just wanted to serve the Lord. Everywhere he'd go, he'd give out uh, uh, gospel tracts. Um, even when he was old and, and in a wheelchair, he got a hat that said World War II veteran. And people come up and say, thank you for your service. And he says, I have something special for you and pull out a, a gospel track and give him the gospel right there. Wow. And he said he didn't like to wear the hat, but it gave him opportunities to witness. That, that's who he was. Just finding every opportunity. When I read, it was after reading of his life, after reading of the, the four influence in his life, the four fathers that you that you detailed there. And then when I got to uh, his wife Norma's words describing him, I, I just highlighted this and I went, isn't this who every single one of us desires to be? These are some of the words that she wrote as you asked her to kind of give a word cloud of what his life was like. Unassuming, mild, compassionate, kind-hearted, forgiving, gracious, gentle, charitable, human, spiritual, pleasant. I mean, you go through these and you're like, you're reading, you're reading, it feels like what the Bible describes as somebody filled with the Spirit of God. You're reading the fruits of the Spirit in this man's life. Um, did he have any turning points? Did he have any major things that, that, that helped him see why he needed to be this human being? You know, he, uh, he grew up in, a, in an ungodly home. And uh, one where his father was a, a brilliant military man, West Point graduate, uh, colonel in uh, World War II, was selected by Patton to be the chief of staff of the 90th Infantry to support the, the uh, uh, tanks rushing through France and Germany. Uh, so he moved around uh, many times as a child. He lived, uh, spent uh, from age three to six in China, and as his family uh, visited uh, other areas of China, he uh, would be uh, raised by a Chinese Anna named Peng, and his first language was Chinese. And so uh, then he uh, went to Fort Leavenworth, uh, uh, Kansas, and then to Seattle, and then to Fort Benning, Georgia. So he moved around quite a bit and was very lonely. Uh, his parents uh, would have uh, these parties all the time to try to work up in the social ranks and, and uh, lonely and uh, disenchanted. And he was struggling in school and his father finally sent him to a Christian military academy. Uh, his father didn't realize he was Christian. It was a Macaulay school in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but the two brothers that started it were born again believers and uh, just had a strong curriculum there. So he got exposed to the Bible. Uh, while he was there, uh, he, really buckled down, learned how to study, uh, rose to the top of his class, even though he came in as a junior, got early acceptance to Princeton University, and then went there uh, to be an ambassador of the United States government. He met a man named Donald Fullerton, and he was, uh, Fullerton was a Princeton graduate who had been a missionary, and then um, uh, had some physical illnesses and had to retire from that. Uh, so he went back to Princeton and just had Bible studies. And my father met him and Fullerton led him to the Lord. And one week later, he got uh, drafted into the army uh, for World War II. But uh, when he was um, uh, accepted Christ, uh, he didn't say, well, I'm going to add this. He was 100% committed. He determined wow. that he had a change of plans that he would be a missionary to China because somehow deep in his brain, there was Mandarin Chinese and he could suddenly remember this and go back to be a missionary. So that was the, uh, the major turning point in his life when he came to know the Lord and, and changed. 
So he came to Christ. He had these four spiritual, or these four fathers: biological, spiritual, theological, scientific. Um, I, I'm, I'm thumbing through. I had a page highlighted. I have so many highlights. I can't find the highlight that I was looking for. I'm like, ah, I've been highlighting too much out of here. But um, and there was a paragraph. His okay. L- l- how did he end up writing this book, the Genesis Flood? That that became. It's just one of those turning points in both science, because what it did to creation science, what it did for creation science, what it did to evolutionary science. Can you can you kind of explain some of the things that that happened there and how he got into that? Yeah. So uh, my father was fascinated by people and places. Growing up in China and other things, he decided to memorize all of the countries in the world, all the providences and all their capitals, and really loved that kind of thing. So when he got to Princeton as a freshman, he signed up for geology, thinking it was geography, and ended up being taught evolutionary paleontology and geology by the world's experts who actually wrote the textbooks on it. So he got a thorough training in geology, hydrodynamics, flood geology, all the different level, you know, the different um, trilobites and all those types of things while he's at Princeton. Then he got drafted into the army and was hoping to get into a special part of the army that didn't actually fight. But after the uh, soldiers went through and captured a, a city or a province and moved on, you have to backfill with some type of government structure because the old uh, leaders are gone. And since he spoke uh, French and German and Spanish and other languages, he thought, well, this would be a great opportunity for me. I'm training to be an ambassador. And so his grandfather helped, or his father, who was in the, you know, a, a ranking military officer, tried to get him into this special program. So he was tentatively accepted. But at the last minute, they realized that since he had taken these geology courses and not enough of the other ones, he was not eligible and they put him into basic engineering. (laughs) And he told his father, I hate engineering and they're forcing me to go against my will. His father, who is not a Christian, sent back an email or a letter, they didn't have emails then, and said, (laughs) he said, son, sometimes there is a higher power that knows your strengths and abilities and has a purpose for you you don't understand. So be a good soldier and do your best at engineering. And that is that. And so he spent a year at Virginia Polytechnic Institute learning uh, engineering and physics and science and mathematics and those types of things against his will, and then was put into a field artillery unit as the computer, the one that figures out all the trajectory for which uh, guns would fire at what level with those kinds of things against the enemy. Uh, When he got back from the army, he was uh, somewhat disillusioned with what he was doing. He, you know, wanted to be a missionary, but wasn't sure how to do it. And he talked to Dr. Fullerton again, and Dr. Fullerton said, you know, finish your education at Princeton, then go to seminary because you really want to be prepared to be a missionary. Well, that summer, he picked up a book called Therefore Stand by Wilbur Smith. And Wilbur Smith argued that the Christian, conservative Christians were being destroyed by higher criticism with no response. And there needed to be a new generation of people who arose and were able to defend the faith. And my father read that and realized that God had given him special abilities, and he was at Princeton. And coming back to Princeton, it was like he was a rocket shot out of a cannon. He was nonstop uh, reaching out to everybody at Princeton. He uh, sent letters to all the freshmen, inviting them to come to Bible studies with Donald Fullerton. He did street ministries. He taught Sunday school classes. He had prayer meetings in his room. He read every Christian book he could get a hold of. And he continued that for the rest of his life. Wow. It, It was unbelievable. And then he got to Grace Seminary. He, you know, contacted the Chinese uh, uh, missions, but uh, there was a, a man that ruined his plans. His name is uh, Mao Zedong, <laughs> and he killed all the Christians and refused to let anyone else, any foreigners, come into China. And my father graduated, and he had no plan, no other plan. He was a missionary to China, and that was it. Well, it turned out that the 
uh, one of the professors in the seminary resigned. And since he was an outstanding student and had really worked to help as a grader, uh, the president of Grace Seminary said, would you come on the faculty because we have a spot for you to do some teaching? And he said, OK. Um, and uh, they had him teaching Genesis, the Pentateuch, Greek exegesis, and uh, uh, some Old Testament books. We started teaching it and really looking at what Genesis said. There was no way that you can fit evolution into creation. So one of the two had to go. And it was one or the other. And he became interested in that and eventually uh, did that as his, uh, as his doctoral thesis. And the fact that he had been previously trained in geology, paleontology, and engineering allowed him to have at least a working knowledge of what science is. And uh, so uh, he was able to work that into his, his uh, doctoral thesis. But that wasn't what was most important. What was most important was understanding what the scripture said and defending the truth. Now, in Winona Lake, Indiana, where he was, there was a summer conference, and they had a man named uh, Cornelius Van Til, oh, who wow. taught a new approach called a presuppositional approach to apologetics. And he argued that man is so sinful that you can't use philosophy to lead them to God. But God is so powerful that you just present the gospel and the Holy Spirit does the work. In fact, you know, Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper mm -hmm than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so there was no apologetics. Dad approached this saying, God says, and then quoted scripture. But he went from Genesis to Revelation and looked up every single passage everywhere that had any comment about either creation or the flood and did the Greek and Hebrew exegesis and hermeneutics using scientific methods, uh, organized methods. And he discovered something that was shocking. There was one and only one narrative in the entire Bible. And that was God literally created the heavens and the earth in six literal 24 hour days. And later he destroyed the world that then was with a global flood that lasted for a year as a punishment for sin. And that was that. That had never been done before, and the Bible teachers that talked about creation uh, was largely led by Seventh-day Adventists that uh, held that position because their leader uh, said that's what they needed to do, and others were, were uh, uh, you know, said, well, this is your opinion, that's your interpretation, um, and you're cherry-picking verses, but uh, he didn't say this is what I believe. He said this is what the Bible says, and that was a, a turning point in how to defend the Bible and how to use inductive uh, study instead of deductive in order to come to your, your conclusion. The problem was when he tried to write the book, he was told you're not allowed to talk about science because you don't have a PhD in geology. And so he wrote to Henry Morris, who he got to know, and he said, you know, this is like a battle between the elephants and the whales. You just can't fight in someone else's domain. So Henry Morris had been trying to write a book as well, and he was struggling with it. Henry Morris was a Bible-believing Christian, but he wasn't a theologian and didn't know how to systematically defend the Bible. My father was a theologian, had a, a background in the sciences, but couldn't argue the scientific approach that somebody trained in the sciences could. So both of them were able to help write each other's part and work back and forth until they got the thing right after many years. And then when it was released, there was almost no promotion. It just rippled through the Christian community where Christian engineers and scientists read it 
And as Andrew Snelling told me, he's one of the first people to become a six-day creationist. I said, what was it that convinced you about a six-day creation and a Genesis flood? And he says, well, I'm a scientist and have real world scientific experience and I know how science works. But when I read the Genesis flood, I was convinced that God said the world was created in six days. And with that conviction, I became a six day creationist. It's what the Bible said that convinced me. And so it really came down to that presuppositional approach. This is this is reassuring to me as as I I am a uh, I've been influenced by Bonson, who was influenced by Van Til. Your dad got to go straight to. I, I'm wow. I'm kind of jealous that uh, he got to know these people. Uh, one of our uh, members, uh, Mary Jo, said her dad gave her the Genesis flood 32 years ago and said, "This is going to change change the way people look at science and scripture." And she just said, "I had no idea how right he was on that." Uh, it did just take off. I want to. I want to read a section here. I found the quote, uh, Kent. It's that page forty that I gave you. The information in the Bible about the origins, purpose, and destiny of man, including judgment for sin or salvation from judgment through the works of Jesus Christ, is very clear. The Genesis flood—that's the book. The Genesis flood not only clarified the orthodox teaching of Scripture on creation and the flood, but also demonstrated that scientific evidence supported the creation and deluge paradigm and refuted the natural evolution paradigm as absolutely impossible. Mechanically, it's impossible and devoid of hard supporting evidence. 60 years later, the creation deluge paradigm remains intact while the natural evolution paradigm has been forced to undergo major revisions and is still a scientific failure. The attraction of the natural evolution paradigm is not science. And I think this is something that people are beginning to see and realize, and your, your dad and Henry Morris saw it years ago. Rather, it is a justification to reject God and his word. The mantra of the unbelieving theologians and scientists is to claim that scientific evidence supports their par paradigm and to ridicule, exclude, and silence anyone who disagrees. Here we are 60 years later, they're still doing the same thing, aren't they? Yeah, and you know, the funny thing about uh evolutionary science, it's a theory without a mechanism. Mm. There's, no, there's no possible way this could have happened by random chance. And every area of science, secretly, the people on the inside know that there is zero supporting evidence. There are no possible known mechanisms by which we could have come to life and lived on this earth and people can exist. But yet, if you question them, you're ridiculed and said, well, you're a flat earth person. You believe that babies uh, come from storks and you <laughs> it, it's it's ridiculous. They do not want to have a legitimate discussion and they can't do it anyway because they've made the fatal mistake of rejecting God. Wow. So creation science is of great value to people who are believers, but it is a snare uh, because to, uh, to unbelievers. And just uh, another thing that's interesting is that the Genesis flood forced the evolutionary theory to catastrophism where the world was radically changed one, uh, you know, in some way, which is, of course is by a Genesis flood. But when you listen to cartoons or narratives or, you know, these things, it was uh, a meteorite that hit the earth. Uh, it was uh, a volcanic eruption. It was earthquakes. It was uh, the, the, uh, a, a um, meteor or a, uh, you know, some a comet came by and, and the, the sh earth shifted. Anything except a flood. A flood, exactly. <laughs> it can be anything but a flood because a flood means judgment. Wow. Hey, guys, on uh, if you're joining me on Facebook or YouTube uh, through social media or our podcast listeners and Creation Today Show audience, I got to let you go here in just a minute, but we did, we we're giving away uh, several copies of this book today, and I just want to announce those winners. Uh, the, the book we're talking about is On the Life of Dr. John C. Whitcomb. Uh, it's called good, A Good and Faithful Servant, and uh, we're being being given his life through the eyes of his son, Dr. David Whitcomb, and I, I just find this fascinating. Um, if uh, If you're joining me on my Facebook page, 
Uh, the winner for Facebook page is Chris Leslie. Chris, all you got to do is message us right there with your name and uh, your information, and we'll send you this book. If you're on the Genesis Facebook page, Nita Smith, you are the winner of this book. Congratulations. If you're on our YouTube channel, Cricket Riddle, Cricket Riddle, you are the winner. So please reach out to us. We got You got to send us your email or something, a way to get in touch with you. Uh, for our Creation Today partners, thank you guys for joining us. We had a lot of great comments in here of people that have influenced your life. Uh, we're going to give a signed copy to a couple of the Creation Today partners. Gary Groon, you are the winner of one of these. And John Armstrong, we're going to send you a signed copy. And Dr. Whitcomb, thanks for being willing to do that for us to sign copies. And we'll make sure and get you their information so we can get those books to them. Uh, hey, if you're joining me on social media, though, thank you guys. I, I find Dr. Whitcomb's life inspiring, uh, fascinating. One of the lives that it's like, man, I, I want to tr uh, try to achieve just a portion, just a fraction of what God was allowed has allowed him to do in his life. So uh, Dr. David Whitcomb, thank you for giving us a little sneak peek into some of his background. I want you to tell some of the stories of, of him meeting Einstein and some of the other things to our partners, but we'll get into that here in just a minute. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, podcast listeners and creation uh, today's show partners, uh, we got to let you guys go. Thanks for joining me. We're going to have a great conversation next week. Really excited about that. Uh, each week, we have just these good discipleship conversations, and you're welcome to join us week after week. Next week, we're actually talking about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon with Dr. Brian Thomas from the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, so looking forward to that conversation. You can join us next week at noon on Wednesday, noon central time. Okay, Dr. Whitcomb. <sighs> All right, okay. The Genesis Flood book had a massive influence.